Right, are we ready? Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, today we've got Mike Graham from the University of Wisconsin Madison talking to us about towards data driven reduced order modeling of flows with complex chaotic dynamics. Thanks. All right, um, it's great to have the opportunity to speak here. Um, this is all pretty new work, so none of this is more than about three years old. Some of it's very, very new. Um, it's largely, oops, largely work done by uh, Daniel Florent, who's a, who was a postdoc with me. He's now an assistant professor at Mechie at the University of Houston, and then some great uh, grad students, Kevin Bang, Alcuino, and Carlos Paris. And this is this is work that's uh, been supported by um, by oops, by DoD, a couple different guises. So. Um, So there we go. So the idea that, that we want to pursue is, is something that is really going to be very familiar to many people in the room. It's just we have high dimensional dynamical systems, very complex uh, time and space dependent signals, and we would like to have models of those dynamical systems. And one particular reason to have a, a dynamical model is if we want to do something if we want to, if we want to do rapid forecasting, if we want to um, design a control algorithm, I'll show that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so there, there are you know several examples. So I come, come from a from a chemical engineering background, so chemical reaction networks. Actually, I was talking with someone at Edinburgh about about complex reaction networks with many many reactants, so those, those have many degrees of freedom. Uh, many people in this room, of course, are interested in uh, turbulent flow, so that's a snapshot from channel flow simulation of QF flow, which on John Gibson's code, and I'll talk more about this later. And then, um, you know, one very interesting and important nonlinear problem where people are interested in forecasting is, of course, weather and, and climate. And so our, our aim, um, is, is to make reduced order models of complex systems. Our focus is on fluid mechanics or models of fluid mechanical systems. And so actually this picture in the middle here is the kind of thing that we're interested in making uh, models of. The, um, the way that, that we've been thinking about that just goes back to this very classical paper from, from Hoff. Um, who makes the observation that um, because of viscosity, the um, dynamics of the Navier-Stokes equations ultimately should live on some finite dimensional manifold in the state space of the, of the system. And I'm, I'm kind of sad that, that Idris isn't here um, because I wrote a paper with Idris as a grad student. Really? Um, on, um, he was working on, at the time on approximate inertial manifolds for various for various systems, um, and I was working on uh, porous medium convection. We had a Galerkin method, and so it turned out that uh, what he was doing on the on the theory side was um, meshed well with some of the computational stuff that we were doing. So my introduction to actually my introduction to a lot of stuff, functional analysis, Sobolev spaces, and things like that, um, and and manifolds. Uh, came from my my uh, work with Patrice a long long time ago now. Um, so the basic idea, which 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 you know, everybody in this room I think is probably familiar with, is we can have a dynamical system that lives in some high dimensional state space. Could be infinite dimensional state space if we have a PD. All right, but in the case of a dissipative PD, what we expect is that after a long enough time, the dynamics are going to settle down onto some finite dimensional manifold N, okay? This is th this little movie here, this is, um, uh, this is the Lorentz system in a periodic case, I think, where my students just made a movie of a bunch of trajectories that are settling down onto, in this case, a one-dimensional limit cycle, okay? And then this, actually, this is also dynamics on a one-dimensional manifold. This is a traveling solution in um, channel flow geometry, right? Um, so, of course, um, 
So we, we know this, you know, this picture from dynamical systems. Um, I'm going to talk about how we're going to represent manifolds and, and dynamical systems. And this has ties to machine learning. And if you read the machine learning literature, you learn about the manifold hypothesis that they use and, and as a partial explanation for the success of, um, of neural networks, for example, is that the, the set of images that you care about representing is a very small set of the total number of possible images. So the idea in machine learning is that there's a relatively low dimensional manifold and that it's, it's points on that manifold that you're interested in, in representing. So in our case, we have something stronger than a manifold hypothesis, at least in, in particular cases where we can prove, or we meaning, meaning actual mathematicians, can prove that there's a, there's a finite dimensional um, invariant manifold, an inertial manifold for, for the dynamics. Um, and you know, the physics behind this at a fundamental level is that diffusion or viscosity damps out short. Okay, um, so, so we're going to try to take advantage of this. And in particular, what we're going to try to do is find mappings from the full state space down to coordinates on this manifold. That would be a, a representation of chi. We're going to find, try to find dynamical systems on that manifold. So H would be coordinates on the manifold. And then we need to go back to the original state space. And that's the basic idea that we're going to pursue in a couple of different contexts here. All right. Uh, so, so this is kind of the manifesto. Uh, we would like to efficiently and, and ideally minimally approximate the manifold where the dynamics live and the, and the dynamics on that manifold. We, we would like to have short-term short predictions as well as long-term statistics. So we would like the representations of, of the dynamics to get the attractor more or less right. That's what I mean by the, by the long-term statistics. So not just predictions for some short time, but the right overall structure in, in state space. Um, so we're gonna look for coordinate transformations. We're gonna use neural networks uh, to do that because neural networks are good at general function representations. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about combining clustering methods with um, these ideas we've been talking about to, to patch together overlapping local representations. And I'll give some motivation for why we want to do that. Um, and so ultimately what we're going to end up with is, is ordinary differential equations or maps. We can do both. Um, but the ODE representation is more is actually more powerful. Um, so we're going to look, look for ODE models for the dynamics on the manifold. So our original dynamical systems are Markovian. And so we want the reduced dynamical systems to be Markovian. All right. So we're not going to use past history to, to, uh, to predict the future. Okay. Um, we would like to be able to use data that's far enough, that's paced far enough apart, but um, where, where you're not going to try to approximate time derivatives, for example. This is in contrast to some other methods which explicitly either need time derivatives or good approximations of them to do the model. I'm not going to talk too much about building in known physics, though we've done a little bit of this with respect to, um, to symmetries. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a couple of cases. So our, this is really data-driven. This is not physics-informed neural networks. This is data-driven uh, model. Okay. And then the last part um, is, is going to be on um, using these low dimensional representations for engineering purposes, um, for control purposes in our, in our case. Um, you know, we're certainly not the only group that's pursuing these kinds of things. There's some very famous uh, Greeks uh, doing this, uh, as well as many other strong people. Um, so um, but the, the, the work that we're doing does have a particular flavor to it. Okay. So just, just to, in terms of where this work lies in the broader framework of what people are doing in uh, data-driven dynamical modeling. So there's been a lot of work so in the past decade that, that, that sort of started with the dynamic mode decomposition of Peter Schmidt. So they, these kinds of basically linear approximations certainly preceded that, that work. Um, so 
the, the dynamic mode decomposition can be viewed as a special case as an of an approximation to the coupon operator for uh, the evolution of observables of a dynamic system. So the nice thing about the coupon operator is, is that it's linear. The not nice thing is that it's infinite dimensional and actually very complex as some of Rich's work has, has revealed. And so most of the work that's been done in this space has been on situations that are fairly low dimensional and situations where the dynamics are in some sense close to linear. So oscillatory or weekly, or, well, oscillatory or quasi-periodic dynamics, um, where you have a small number of frequencies that, that, uh, that dominate. We're, we're actually working on this for some more complex cases, but that's, uh, that's, not, that's not the story. Um, there's a very popular approach that's called Cindy, which is a version of what's called uh, symbolic regression. So you have data, you assume it satisfies some system of ODEs, you choose a very broad functional form. So you say that, that uh, the right-hand side is, is, um, is polynomials. And what Cindy does is actually form a sparse right-hand side that does a good job representing the data. And, 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 and Cindy actually requires data for the state variable and for time derivatives. You're basically doing a linear fit with a sparsity penalty um, for the coefficients in front of each of the nonlinear terms, linear quadratic term, for meet polynomial representations, for example. Here. And so this works quite nicely for low dimensional uh, systems. But again, it requires either data or estimates for time derivatives. And then there are some approaches that really come from uh, machine learning. Um, so uh, versions of so-called recurrent neural networks. One is a, a long, short time memory network, which basically has a, has a hidden state, which can be quite high dimensional. All right? And similarly for reservoir uh, computing, um, again, there's a, there's a hidden, uh, there are hidden variables. And so the state representations in here are generally much larger than the actual state of the of the system. They might for for um, simulations of, for example, the Kermode Sipchinsky equations on a on a 64 point mesh, um, some of these representations might have thousands of internal units of freedom. So you're expanding the state variable. So this is this is not reduced or modeling. That said, it can be a very effective way to, to make uh, predictions uh, for, to make forecasts. So our approach is, is, is quite different from these and that we really want re lower dimensional models, reduced order models. We want them to be Markov. We want them to be to respect the original uh, Markovian nature of dynamics. And uh, we don't want to have to have access to timing. All right. So I'll talk about a couple different goals. So, so we're going to talk first about this dimension reduction uh, approach, kind of the, the, the first step at it. Um, and then a, a refinement that we're working on now um, that uses local representations. And then I'll talk about an application in, uh, in control, which would be a, is hopefully a step toward uh, doing things like control in, in complex turbulent systems. Okay, so um, part one, okay, so we want to discover and predict the dynamics on this uh, so-called machine. All right, so the basic idea is really quite, quite simple. So we have data. Um, in our case, um, what we've done so far is simulation data, but we actually have real experimental data that we're, that we're working on now. Um, so we have data in the ambient space, which might be the, the, the 64 points on a mesh for the Kermode-Sipchinsky equation. Um, it might be 10 to the fourth points on a mesh for our simulations of, of Coetla, for example. Um, we would like to find a mapping down to a much smaller number of degrees of freedom. So, so, our, our, so our variable H here, this would be coordinates on, the, on this uh, manifold. Okay, and then we need to make mapping back to the full state. All right, so we have inputs that are just the, the, the variables that are given our, our states at, at a bunch of different times. 
And in this case, the outputs are the states at the, at the same time. And what we want is just, can we find that mapping and that mapping so that what we output is the same as what we hit? Okay, this is a very standard um, uh, problem in machine learning. And the basic structure uh, for it is called an undercomplete autoencoder. So you start with a large number of degrees of freedom, you learn a mapping to a small number of degrees of freedom, you learn another mapping back, which was learn these two things simultaneously, and you make a comparison between the data and the prediction of your data. So there's the mapping and there's the inverse mapping. Right, so we could use we could use an inverse. Okay. Um, and so we want to learn a, a neural network, so two neural networks actually, chi and chi check, the parameters of those neural networks, so theta one and theta two, want to learn those so as to minimize this loss. Right? So that's actually a quite straightforward and standard thing that's, that's done in machine uh, learning. Um, it turns out that it can be quite advantageous to work in the PCA basis for doing this. So we actually change coordinate, we do, P we do principal components analysis, we change basis, in we change coordinates into that basis, and then we actually do the, the autoencoder in terms of the PCA mode amplitudes, essentially. All right. And one thing I want to talk about here is one thing that, that actually improves efficiency is to learn the difference between the data and the low dimensional PCA projection. Of the, of the data. So it's like starting with PCA as your initial guess and then making a nonlinear correction. To it. Okay. So those are just some de details that, that actually help with the, the, the convergence and the efficiency of the representation. Other than that, this is very fairly standard. Okay? Everything, everything in terms of the neural networks, very standard. Stochastic gradient descent, various tricks for improving the convergence rate. So that I want to talk about. So that's the first part. So that's just learning the, the coordinates of, on the, on the manifold. I haven't said how we learn how, what the dimension of that manifold is. Yeah, I'll, come, I'll come to that. Excuse me. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, why is the PCA basis better? Is it just because the error in the wrong is not the Um The PCAs, so our data is here, all right? The PCA approximation would be here, okay? And so we're, we're learning that we're learning that difference, okay? There are actually some cases where you can parameterize the data with the PCA basis. In that case, if your data you know, lies like this, you can actually you know, write, that would be a coordinate. So you can actually, in some cases, do a linear encoder, just project down onto this. And then the decoder is what gives you that error. Okay, and, and I guess the other way to think about this is if we had, um, if, we, if we took chi and chi check to be linear, then the answer that the neural network would give would be PCA. So a linear autoencoder does the same dimension reduction as PCA. Okay. So that's a that's a reason to, to use PCA to use the PCA basis. Okay. We don't have to, but this works works better. Okay, so that's part of it. So so then the other part of the story is that once we learn the coordinate representation from the data, we want to learn a dynamical system. So now our inputs are are the data data points now map down onto the manifold, so at different times. And the outputs are the results some time, some tau time units later. All right, and we, find, we want to find a right-hand side so that we integrate that right-hand side. And, and so delta H is just H of T1 plus tau minus H of T1, right? It's just the change in, in H over time interval tau. And presumably, we've got lots of data at different time points from our dynamical system. And so this is the loss that we want to minimize. And so now what you need to learn is this right-hand side function, G. And the tilde here is just the representation, just, just that it's an approximation. Here, the neural network coefficients are feet. 
So if we, if we knew the form of G, but not the coefficients, this would be data assimilation, okay? So we're assuming an arbitrary form, okay? So, so, so now we're using a neural network representation. We actually have other work where we're doing kind of the data assimilation approach on some different problems as well. And then, okay, so you want to do uh, some kind of gradient descent technique, which means you need to calculate gradients. So the classic way to do this, so if you have a, if you have a differential equation constrained optimization problem, the classical approach is that you end up with a um, finding the Euler-Lagrange equation and you have an adjoint problem to solve backward in time. Okay, so you can do that. And we've, we've done that. Another approach, um, which is enabled by modern software, is just to use automatic differentiation, just differentiate right through the code that's the, of your ODE solver. Okay? And so we use both of those approaches. And it turns out that in the problems that we've looked at, doing the automatic differentiation turns out to, turns out to work okay, it's faster in the cases that and I should say that this, this framework of, of, of doing the, of setting things up this way and doing the automatic differentiation through a solver, uh, this is from a, a fairly recent. Okay. Um, so one thing to emphasize here is that tau does not have to be small. So we, we're never estimating, we're never estimating H dot directly from H. Okay. And so one of the things that I'll point out is how far apart our data can be in time. And, and still enable us to get a good model. We can also learn uh, discrete time. This is actually much easier. It's just learning a mapping of the data at time t and learn the mapping to the time tau, tau time. It's easier but less powerful. So that's the basic setup that we're going to use. So our first model problem is. Um, very popular model problem, curve mode of equation. Periodic domain. Um, and we're going to look at this in a parameter regime that's been actually quite well characterized, in particular by Frederick's okay. So I won't talk too much, uh, too much more about that. Um, so so what, do we, what do we get? So the first question is, how do we determine the number of dimensions of the manifold? OK, so one thing that we can do and as we just look at the look at the mean squared error from from test data, so data that we didn't train the networks on, it's fresh fresh data, um, and then just keep track of that loss as a function of the number of dimensions that you choose for your for h. Okay, so this is what PCA will give, and actually that's that's a nice exponential decay in the mean squared error. Um, so that would be good. That's a good linear. Uh, in your approximation. Um, what we see, and, and it's really quite beautiful for relatively small domains for the Kermodos division is you get an order of orders of magnitude drop in the mean squared error at a certain dimension. And so we, we just really quite fortuitously picked this, this number, this domain size L equals 22, which Frederick has characterized really extensively. And, and they had gone through um, really a lot of work looking at Lyapunov exponents um, and things like that to estimate the dimension of the, of the nerd manifold for this. Um, and, and so we, we did this fairly naively and found this big drop at eight. And, and that's indeed the, the number that Frederick's uh, group uh, found. Um, if we go to a higher domain, the, the manifold, the estimated manifold dimension goes up. Our, 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 our first efforts were, have, have, and actually everything I'll talk about here has been from this relatively naive method. Just change the number of dimensions and look at where the mean squared error goes down. Uh, there's some very, very recent work in the machine learning autoencoder literature that suggests a nicer way to do that. And we're, we're, uh, we're just working on that now. Um, and that method, um, gives results that are consistent. Okay, so these are low numbers, eight dimensions, 18, 28 dimensions, but they're not three. They're not, you know, Lorentz attractor low. They're not turbulent numbers, but they're, but they're, they're not, uh, they're not trivial. Numbers. Okay, 
And then we can then we can look at the evolution. Now that we have these autoencoders, we can look at the evolution. Um, and so here, this is a, this is a learning the right hand side for data space ten time units part. And so for reference for um, the kermode sivashinsky equation at this domain size, which here is L equals 22, uh, the, the Apinov time is 20 time units. So this is data half a Lyapunov time apart. Okay, so fairly far apart. Uh, this is the time series of the, of the data. This is the model uh, from the same initial condition. This is, this is just the difference between the two. So you see, you see some difference here where there's in, this interesting dynamics there, um, but the error is actually relatively small. So this peak shows up at 20 time units. That's the up and on time. Um, in this case, the, the error remains fairly small for nearly 40, 40 time units. And actually most of the error in this case is phase. Phase just drifts a little bit from the predicted solution relative to the exact solution, okay? So that's just one, one uh, particular data set, just to, just to point out that with this data fairly far apart, we can get um, reasonable results. Yes? That is absolute difference for this percentage. This is, this is... Error. That's not percentage error. Let's, I don't think, let's see. I mean, no, no, I think it's just, I think it's just absolute error. Okay. All right. Uh, actually, we have, we have the relative error results, I think, on the next slide. Um, oh, maybe, maybe. Oh, these are actually, I'll come back to this. So, so um, we can look at the time correlation function for this, for this data. Uh, the blue curve is, is the, that's the data. And actually this is normalized in terms of Lyapunov times. Um, the X's are the discrete model with, with data spacing um, given by the color. Um, the smooth dashed lines are the, are the, are the ODE model. Um, and so actually if the data is spaced 16 time units apart, which is nearly Lyapunov time, we don't do very well. But actually once we move down, um, the, the time correlation function is quite good. These results here, so what we've done here, this is ensemble average prediction error. So now we've just taken a whole bunch of initial conditions and found the, and run them for it and compare it to the exact results. And then the D here, this is that, this would actually be just the mean square difference between two randomly chosen data vectors. Okay, so that's the way we've normalized this. And so actually in the ODE, in the ODE representation, so the error is, is relatively small, a few percent over short times. Again, this is normalized in the up and up times and eventually becomes, becomes one. If, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you go long enough, then the data vectors will be, will be um, it'll be as if you chose two independent samples from, from the data. All right. So one important lesson from this is that learning the continuous time evolution works much better than the discrete time evolution. We can learn this from data that's halfway up enough time apart. Right. Um, and, and then actually we get for, for larger L where the dynamics are higher dimensional, the, the prediction times are short. So that's kind of a, a summary of the, of the trajectory accuracy. And then the other thing that we can look at is the long time statistics. So what is the attractor look? And the way we've chosen to represent that is with the, the joint probability density of the first and second derivatives of the signal. And the reason for that is that in the kermode sivashinsky equation, uh, the first derivative is analogous to the turbulent production term in Navier-Stokes. And the second derivative is, is analogous to the turbulent uh, dissipation term. And so those things are things you care about for never stocks. So those are things that we care about for, for Kermode submissions. So these are the data, the, the PDFs, joint PDFs for L equals 22, 44, and 66. And then these are the, these are the model predictions. These are probabilities on a log scale. Okay, so there's quite, so these are actually quite infrequent events out here. Um, and and um, we do extremely well on, on predicting the, essentially the shape of the attraction. 
these quantities. Uh, one way of characterizing the difference between these two is just with the kohlbeck leibler divergence DKL, and we've just plotted that as a function of the, of the data space. The, the reds, the discrete model, which doesn't do that well, the continuous time models, again, with, with data space, you know, more than half a layoff and off time apart, we still reproduce the attractor very well. And actually this, this little baseline here is if we just two, if we took two sets of the true data, find the, found the PDFs and found the KL divergence between those two, that would be this. So that, that you should think of as a baseline for, for these results. All right, so for Kermode Sivashinsky, um, we have um, a, a framework that, that, works, that works quite well. It's Markovian, reduced dimension, um, gives us reasonable trajectory predictions and, and gives us um, um, also very good attractive predictions. Right? We get the shape of the track. Right. Okay, so that's, um, so now we're, we're working on um, uh, moving to, to a harder problem. Okay, and oops. See how these movies gonna play. So these are, so these are, so one of these is a turbulent simulation from channel flow uh, at, I think Reynolds number 600 um, with, with about 40,000 uh, degrees of freedom. And the other one is a 25 simulation from a 25 dimensional model. Yeah. Okay. So visually, if you just look at these, you, you won't be able, unless you're really, really uh, well versed in QF flow, um, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between these. So the, the one on the left is the, is the DNS, and the one on the right is the low dimensional representation. And basically, we went through the same procedure as before. Um, here, we don't, we don't know that the dimension is, is, is 25. Our, our kind of naive techniques based on the mean squared error, they become kind of fuzzy as you go to higher dimensional systems. And so, you know, with, with the dimension of eight, you get a very nice sharp delineation um, in the mean squared error between dimensions that are, that are too low and, and, and above it. Needed. As you go to higher dimensions, that simple um, simple characterization doesn't work, work very well. And so what you need to do um, is basically combine the autoencoder error with the error from the dynamical models. And by, and by combining the two, we can get a pretty good estimate of, of what the dimension should be. Okay. And again, we're, we're working on we're working some things that are better. All right. Um, and so if we look at um, Statistics. So this is just this the mean square streamlines velocity fluctuations, uh, the data that's from the DNS, the prediction that's from our 25 dimensional model. We can actually um, we get quantitative agreement, 25 dimensional model. Here's input energy input versus dissipation. The blue is the data. So what we miss in this case is these infrequent excursions. We get the core. Of the probability density very well. Okay, but we don't get these excursions very well. There are a couple of reasons um, why that why that might be. And, and that kind of takes me to the next next topic. All right. Um, one other thing that we can do is now with this very low dimensional model, we could just do Newton's method on it and find equilibria. And find um, periodic orbits. And so those are periodic, those are equilibrium periodic orbits for the low dimensional model. Um, and we're looking right now at how we how well these correspond to solutions to true problem. For the equilibria, we already know are good. And, and I know Alex working right now on the comparisons with this, between this periodic orbit and, and what you would find in the system. Okay. Can you just initialize? I mean, is that what you do? You take so what he's doing, yes. Yeah, so I think what he's doing now, what he's Doing so, you can use the prediction as an initial condition, and then, yeah. then, and then land on a periodic orbit. It's, yeah, similar. Yeah, that's so that's working. Okay. Um, all right. So so uh, this is kind of a takeaway. Um, so so far so good. I think in terms of um, being able being of, of this framework giving useful results. 
Uh, we actually have some data from Mike Schatz and Maroon and Gregoria that we're looking at uh, right now. Uh, for this, we're looking at using partial measurements and time delays, so basically Talkin's theorem, uh, uh, to, to develop low dimensional representations essentially in time delay coordinates, which is actually seems to be working pretty well. Um, the, so, one thing that we've been thinking about more recently, so we come back to this. And so we miss, we're missing these excursions in this, in this case, right? And there's a more general problem actually with um, just using a, a one, trying to make one global coordinate change from the full state uh, down to the, to the manifold coordinates. Um, Um, and that, and that is a, in general, it can't work, all right? And this actually goes back to Poincaré and, the, and, and the, kind of the origins of differential geometry, that a, a manifold is locally, locally Cartesian, obviously, right? But globally, it doesn't have to look, tar, tar, doesn't have to look like Rn at all, right? So it's a two torus, locally, you can flatten pieces out into R2, but globally, you have to stitch smaller pieces together to construct the full manifold, to represent the full manifold. And so each of these little pieces is a chart and the whole collection of them is an atlas. And, and so if you want actually a minimal, rep, minimal dimensional representation, you need to use this formalism, okay? Um, and also, we think that this formalism is advantageous for systems with complex dynamics where you have different things going on in different parts of states. Okay. So let me just, so, so we've been uh, uh, trying, to, trying to think of a good, uh, a good example to illustrate the problem with kind of a monolithic method um, if you really want a minimal description. So here's a circle in 2D. And if we want, so, so if we want, you know, 1D representation, we start here, start here, so zero around a two pi, right? But now we have a discontinuity in the map. You could unwrap this. You could say, well, I'm just gonna let the, you know, the phase variable go on and on, but then we just, we're not, we're not it's not the topology of a circle anymore, okay? So to represent a circle, you need two charts. So, and they overlap a little bit. So you have a coordinate representation here and a coordinate representation here, and then a mapping that goes, that takes you between those two coordinate representations, right? That's what, that's what Andre did. Um, if you just say, well, I'm gonna take data on the circle in, in two Cart uh, in Cartesian coordinates, and I'm gonna try to do what I, what I introduced before in one, to, to map down to one dimension. So let's say this is our test data. Okay, points on the circle. So point A gets mapped to here, point B gets mapped to here. So that all looks good. But what if we have data in between A and B? All right, that data there, that's gonna get, so this point is that point, this point is that point. So what will happen is when you decode that, this is gonna get wrapped back around on itself. And if you just take it, you just take an autoencoder and do this, this is what we see. Okay, because the autoencoder, this you're just finding a, a, a map from R2 to R. Okay. And this is what you're going to find if you if you try to do this in in in, um, in one dimension. All right. And so if all you care about is the data here, the you pay a large price in error for a small part of your data set. Okay, and that might be acceptable in some cases. But if you want to do dynamics, if you have limit cycling here, you'd like to be able to just track this around and not have any problems Oops. as you move, as you move around the circle. Okay, so we want to avoid that. And the way to avoid that is quite straightforward. The recipe essentially comes from Bonqueray. You find these local coordinate representations that overlap and you stitch them together. Uh, and so that's that's basically this this framework here. So we have we have a por portion of the 
of the torus, for example, we have a mapping. This would be from R3, for example, in the drawing, down onto R2. All right, and you have to be able to go back. You have um, there's a piece missing. Um, and then we have a local representation of the of the dynamics in this patch. And then we overlap the patches. We'll have two overlap, we'll have two dynamical systems actually that we'll learn in, in those patches. And we have certainly non-unique ways of moving from one to the other. It shouldn't matter too much if both of these, if both of the autoencoder representations are and, and the and the dynamic representations are good in the in this overlap. Just in the interest of time, let me just go to, because so I've done this on a bunch of cases, some very simple things, you know, just periodic dynamics on a circle, periodic or quasi-periodic dynamics on a torus, various kermitus and Mashinsky models or uh, um, parameters. And what's interesting is this particular case where, where, are these, where there are these bursting dynamics in kermitus and Mashinsky. So you'll sit near a saddle point for a long time, with a particular phase, and then you will flip very quickly to a different steady state that's just shifted in phase from the first one. Okay, and so basically you have saddle point heteroclinic, nearly heteroclinic connection, another saddle point. So this is very challenging dynamics to capture. So this this is what the if you project onto the the first couple Fourier modes. There are your two saddle points here, these nearly heteroclinic connections between the two. Okay. So very different time scales in the, in the system. Very, very, very bursty behavior, which is one thing that we care about with regard to turbulent dynamics. Um, so this is the data. And our model reduced down to three dimensions. This is, so here's the kind of the skeleton of overlapping charts. And here's the, here's the dynamics. We don't quite get everything right here. Um, and the reason is that the, the period of the, the, the amount of time you spend near these saddle points depends very sensitively on how close you come into the stable mantle. But the period will diverge as you get closer and closer. All right, so we can't quite capture in, in quantitative detail the, the separation in time scales here. But we get the shape of the attractor right, and we get the, we get the overall dynamics in, in three, three dimensions okay, with, with six charts. If we try to do this, so, so let's say, okay, well, um, we should be able to do this with one chart, maybe not in a minimal number of dimensions, but we should be able to do it in six dimensions from Whitney's theory, okay? And that's it's sort of the, 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 the saving grace of the one of the monolithic representation is if, you're not, if you don't care that, you're di that your dimension is minimal, it should work because there's always some dimension that your manifold will embed it, okay? Um, so fine, but it turns out that even when you go up to six dimensions, if you try to look at the mean squared error as a function of dimension, um, we still do way better Two orders of magnitude better in mean squared error. These are just different models, different autoencoders. We still do way better in terms of the autoencoder uh, dimension. And the six dimensional representation simply cannot even qualitatively re reproduce the dynamics here. They, they, can't, they can't do it. And we've actually tried quite hard uh, to get that. Okay. So, so a conventional uh, approach will will fail. All right. Um, and so what we're interested in doing right now is, is applying this to more complex systems. So we're applying it to Kolmogorov flow right as we, as we speak. And I'm, I'm not, you know, some people are really good at coming up with cute acronyms for, for uh, their, their methods. I'm not, I'm not good at that. But we came up with one for this one. I don't know if it's a good one or not, but I, but I, but I find it entertaining. So, so uh, we call it candy. All right. Um, so the last thing that I'll talk about just very briefly 
is um, one of the engineering motivations for doing this kind of work. And that's to um, apply it downstream in, in, in a design um, or a control application. And so what we've done very recently is, is to combine the reduced order modeling that I described for Kremlin-Shinsky with, uh, with uh, a, a nonlinear uh, control method, which is called reinforcement learning control. And so, um, so reinforcement learning has gotten a lot of press um, in solving, in, in basically developing um, algorithms that can beat humans at chess or Go. Um, there's some there's some flow control work in this in this area, and so we're going to apply a, a, a reinforcement learning control approach to try to um, uh, try to reduce the, the analog of drag in the current mode of Okay, so um, I won't, I'm not going to say too much about the the framework for reinforcement learning. The basic idea. There is you have a you have an instantaneous reward, which in our case will be the 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 sum of of the um, dissipation and the power input for from the actuators. Okay, we want to we want to include the cost of the control in the objective function, and and so reinforcement learning finds attempts to find a policy that optimizes the the that minimizes the future cost of your of your control with the discount factor um, for for future uh, basically for future uh, penalties. Okay, so I have a backup slide which I can show on that, but I want just because we're running a little low on time, I just wanted to get to the kind of reduced order modeling aspect too. So we've got Karamoto Sivashinsky now, and now what we're doing is just adding um, a, a a forcing in the form of four localized regions where we impose a, a Gaussian uh, a Gaussian forcing on the, on the system. So you can think of them as jets. Okay. Uh, and, and so can we with these four jets? So basically there's four uh, actuators with an amplitude A, A sub I. Um, can we can we find a policy of actuation that will reduce the drag in this system? So here, here's our here's our drag reduction analog. So we're just minimizing the total production dissipation and energy cost for actuation. Um, so we need to uh, we need to determine the model from data. And so what we're going to do here is we're just going to take our our model system and we're just going to impose some random actuation sequences to it. So here, this is. So here, these are just the, the time series of the four actuator amplitude. Two. So we just, we just solve our system with those randomly changing actuator amplitudes. And then we learn the right-hand side, but now we have those additional four parameters in the system. Okay. And so that goes into the, to the, to the reduced order model, to the right-hand side of our differential equation. So I don't think I don't think I have a good. Okay, so some of this is stuff you already seen. So here, if we have the unactuated data, this is the same picture that I showed before. Okay, so there's the big drop in mean squared error when we get to a dimension. Here now we're adding actuations. So so now we don't have the natural dynamics. We're poking on the system, and so you can just imagine that you're that you're knocking it off the attractor. It's going to try to relax back. And then we're going to give it a, niche, a different knock a few time units later. And so the, the manifold here is going to get fattened out because we're, we're knocking the, the dynamics off what would be the natural manifold. And so this is kind of the way I, I envision it. And so when you learn the model, it turns out to get to you know, roughly the same mean squared error, 10 to the minus 5. We needed 12 dimensions instead of eight. Okay, so those are the those are those would be off attractor dimensions from the natural dynamics. Okay. And actually if you just look at the power spectral density, you're, you're exciting some higher wave numbers when you poke on the system. So that's our model, which we learned from open loop data here. 
And then, um, and, and then we apply the um, reinforcement learning algorithm. So now the algorithm isn't learning from the original data set, it's learning from the reduced order model, which is, which is much less expensive. Okay, because it's far fewer degrees of freedom, all right? Um, and this is just comparisons. This is true dynamics. NOD ROM is neural ODE slash reduced order model, okay? And these are with the, this is just the actuation sequence. Um, let me just get to the punchline. So here's what the reduced order model with the controller does. So the controller turns on at t equals zero. You see some of the natural dynamics uh, continuing for some time, but then the system settles down to a, to a steady state. Okay. And so here, this is the dissipation and the, and the production. So, so they're settling down to much lower values than they would be in the natural system. So we're reducing the energy consumption. So that's with the reduced order model. Um, here's with the true system, which is the, the karamoto sinashinsky equation. The same thing is happening, but the, there's a little bit of error in the model. And so actually the, the, the response is a little bit, little bit less weakly, less, less strongly named. Okay, so the control action isn't quite as effective. But you end up in the same place. You end up on a steady state. And what turns out to be really interesting from my point of view, is that that steady state is um, the continuation of an of a unstable steady state of the kuramoto sivashinsky equation at these parameter values. So what the algorithm has done has been to find and to stabilize an unstable steady state that, that's, that's in, the, in this dynamical system. We never gave it data on that on that steady state. So the, the, the training never learned anything explicitly about the existence of unstable steady states in the vicinity of the attack. The algorithm found that. And I just find that really fascinating from the dynamical systems point of view. And also, you know, spending a large amount of my, my career trying to find those solutions, right? This algorithm found one and stabilized. Now, whether that's a general strategy for finding new, new, new uh, recurrent states, that's another story. Uh, but anyway, as a control scheme, uh, this works quite well because that state, it's an unstable steady state. You don't have to do anything to keep it there if, you, if, you're, if you're right on it. So you just have to, you have to re respond to the perturbations. So that, I think, is, a, is, is quite interesting. And we're, right now, we're combining... Uh, the, the reduced order model and the reinforcement learning for the coet flow uh, and channel flow uh, examples. All right, and so I will just um, I'll just leave it at leave it at that. And happy to take any questions. Good, thank you much. Questions. Let's try and see if I want to do now. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 I'm interested in this too. Yeah. And I was I was very excited by your, your result in the Kuramoto Shivashinsky equation. You found that drop between seven and eight. And, and then you hinted that, that it doesn't quite perform so well when you go to high dimensions. So okay. what actually happens? You just see nothing? So um so you 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 the the mean squared error continues to, to decline. But as you go up to 44 and 66, yeah. um, the drop becomes weaker. You can still see it. You can still see it. Up at, you can still see it at 66. For higher, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't be, it's not sharp. Right. And so then what we've done then is, and we have a we have a um, preprint that we hope will be published soon, um, where we basically take the the um, the autoencoder representations with different dimensions and then learn dynamical models as a function of dimension. And there what you actually find 
is that you do get a jump. So what you find, yeah, so and I think what we did there, I think that might have been we've done a few things, but but we we're kind of fascinated by just the attractor shape, so the, the PDFs. And um what you what you find is that if the if the if there are too few dimensions, um, you generally get large errors. So the way this typically works is you have to train multiple models because there's a stochastic as aspect of all of this. The initial is the initialization is stochastic, stochastic gradient descent is, yeah. is stochastic. And, and so you'll find you know, a family of models. You know, maybe one will do well in terms of this measure, but most of them will not. And as you increase the, the number of dimensions, this just collapses. This collapses. And so eventually, this, this becomes very small. And actually, I, I mentioned this baseline measure for the DKL. You can actually get pretty close to that baseline measure. And so, and so at this point, um, it, I, I think, whoops, you need a combination of the autoencoder and the dynamical models. But with that combination, um, this, this actually is quite, it, it's, it's quite robust and it's, and it's quite uh, dramatic. And what it'll give you, it'll, 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 um, it won't tell you, you know, exactly what the dimension is, but it'll tell you that you need to be at least so many dimensions and it's going to get a, a poor muscle. Is this in your 2021 outcome? It is, yeah, right. which we're hoping will be published shortly. Yeah, yeah, so that's all, that's all there. And then we have, so we have another, we didn't develop this method, but there's a method, um, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of machine learning black magic with autoencoders where you add linear layers in the middle. And, and what you can do Actually, is you then you look at the um, then you look at the rank of the covariance matrix in the in the um, in the latent space, yeah. um, and, the, and and that rank should give you the number of dimensions. And so that we're cautiously optimistic that that's more robust. We're we're we don't quite understand it, um, but that's interesting. yeah. So, okay, with that. Lacan, Jan Lacan, um, I think, yeah. Oh. So, maybe not surprisingly, he's, he's one of the yeah. machine learning pioneers. Yeah, so we don't quite understand this method. It's not clear that they do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, that's, that's what we're looking at. Okay. Yeah. Um, how expensive is it? So, uh, if I understood it right here, say four controllers and you're firing it random to get the data. How expensive is that, and how many combinations uh, should you have? So that's a great question. I don't think there's a. I don't think we have a complete answer to that. What I what I would say, you know, in terms of the, for example, the coet flow simulations. So we reduced from forty thousand. So so first of all, this is all data driven. So so you're assuming that you have a data set that that captures the state, right? And so you've done a big DNS. You've done one big. You've done one big DNS. Okay, and that's what you use to train your um, your models. Once that part's done, then the models are quite inexpensive to run. And so the the issue is you've got to you've got to amortize the initial cost of of being of doing a big DNS. But you know you know in the case of the um, uh, you know the, the the reinforcement learning. So that algorithm is, is fairly is fairly expensive. And so you, you, know, you, you basically you make predictions. There's, there's kind of an involved algorithm for that. And so if you could do that, you know, so you should do a whole bunch of open loop experiments, for example, make a model from those open loop experiments, and then learn your control algorithm from the model rather than um, an experiment. Which can be very expensive, All right? Then, then, then you hopefully have gained a lot there. So, in right? this scenario, there's just one DNS of a regular query flow. One everything. DNS, one long DNS. Everything else, the control aspect is on the. So the ask, so the idea is that we haven't. We're doing this now for for query. Done it for only 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 really completely done it for. for 
But the idea is you're, you're now doing this on a 25 dimensional plan analysis rather than a 40,000. Okay. And would this be, say, Reynolds number appendix? Six, oh, no, 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 no. So, so this, so the manifold where the data lives is absolutely dependent on the parameters. And for example, if there are bifurcations, then the, the dimension of that manifold will change. So we have not, we have not looked at that problem. But in, in fairness to us, neither have most of the other people uh, studying these kinds of problems. Um, it's hard. What's that? It's hard. It's hard. So, so there, what you would be doing in that case, your, your parameter, now what you're going to have to do is um, basically the, the dimension is going to increase with the Reynolds number. So you're going to take the highest Reynolds number, learn that manifold, and then how it's parameterized to lower Reynolds numbers. And, and then what's going to happen is that some of those dimensions are going to collapse away. And then that actually makes, um, then, so that's hard because, um, well, because that's a qualitative change in the topology, changing the dimension of the manifold is, is a big change. All right, so so you would you would need other tricks to do that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for the same did also be for the point to to increase the dimension like from forty thousand to let's say four hundred thousand. So still the dimensions would be say reduced dimension twenty five. Well, presumably, I, I think in this I don't remember why we chose forty thousand, but I think it was because we knew that was a converged. Uh, but, but if it is a well resolved simulation, then the dimensions are reduced. Oh, well, yeah. So actually, so one way to do so, if you, we've done this, so you go to 40,000, we haven't done 400,000, but you know, if you look at it, so basically just look at the Fourier modes, right? So this, this is nice spectral code. So those, you're just going to be in the tail of the, of the Fourier representation. And so um, those things will be so small that the, you know, the error in the autoencoder is going to be larger. Than the error in the spectral, than than a, than a well resolved spectral simulation. All right, so you shouldn't need to over. There's no get. There's no benefit to over resolving your DNS. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's no new information there. Sorry. Yeah. Just just one final question. So, uh, the optimum pieces that you learn from the data driven machine learning uh, have that ever been compared to an equation based. Uh, so we're not learning a basis in the sense that a basis is a linear representation. Right, right, right. Okay. So it cannot be, in a sense, compared to any of the equations. Should be... so, so one thing that we can do is we can use a linear encoder, nonlinear decoder. And actually for Kermode Svashinsky, that often works quite well. And that's because for Kermode Svashinsky, the dynamics, the, the manifold, the manifold looks like this. So it can be parameterized on, with this. So we, we can let's make that variable x, make that variable you know, y, of, y of x. So this, this basically is your decoder. So that, that difference. So in some cases, you can get away with, with, with less than kind of the full blown structure that we have here. Certainly in the case of some of the current whoops, some of the current of Sivashinsky results, you can certainly do that. So the, the archive paper, the 2021 archive paper, we did that for a lot of the results. Yeah. Which is to say that a linear projection will give you the correct dynamics, but it won't, but you need to anonymous mapping to correctly get the state back out. So you get the, you'll get the, you know, if the dynamics are a limit cycle, your linear projection will give you a linear limit cycle. Right? But if you want to quantitatively know the state, just just the you you need to go back nonlinearly to the full state. Yeah. 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 So you showed in the point flow that uh, your data was able to capture the PDA, the core of the core of the PDA, but not the teams. Is that I, so? Two things. The first one is that expected in the sense that the system there is a dimensional reduction, it's mainly the mean one is that one 
I, 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 so that's a good question. I don't think it's so much that. I think there are two things. Um, one is that you know rare events don't get sampled very often, and so you know we're learning the mean squared error. Um, those those excursions only make a small contribution to the overall mean squared error, which is one reason to use this domain decomposition, the charts analysis method, because now the error in one part of the domain. Um, the autoencoder there is decoupled from the autoencoder over here. They're going to learn their parts separately. All right. And so, and so even if this stuff is infrequent, um, it's, it's, not, it's not diluted by the fact that there's all sorts of very frequent stuff going on over here. And so that's one of the rationales for, for candy Yeah. Great. Any other questions? If not, then let's thank Mike again. All right, thank you very much.